Okay, so today we're going to be talking about uh, Manichaeism, uh, and um, it was founded by the uh, charismatic and self-proclaimed apostle of light, Manny, <laughs> born in southern Mesopotamia in 216 CE. Uh, that's basically today's Iraq. And he was martyred for his faith about 60, uh, six years later. Uh, his beliefs may be best described as dualistic as well as Gnostic. It's kind of a hybrid religion that combines elements from the, the East and the West. Uh, there's a little bit of Christianity there. Uh, there is a, a little bit of Zoroastrianism there. And yes, there is a little Buddhism there too. <laughs> so it's like, wow, so this belief system uh, seems to be almost uh, ecumenical, taking a, a little bits and pieces from all these kinds of traditions. Uh, now, um, uh, I have to say that uh, the original writings of, of, of Mani were, were destroyed. We, we thought most of them were destroyed. And so much that remained or left behind were those at first of his critics. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a little journey. And the journey is one of discovery. What I mean by that is we're going to start uh, with uh, perceptions of Manichaeism uh, from, uh, at first from the Christian and often polemic perspective. Then what's going to happen is I'm going to go through in order of discovery of the new documents. And we'll go right up to today, and we'll see how perceptions of Manichaeism changes over time. But scholarship at first was dominated uh, by these earlier sources. So let's get through the, the murky parts, and then we're going to get to the, the, the specifics. Now, when I talk about specifics, I mean, we're, by the time we end this, this talk, you're going to know all about Manichaeism from the Manichaeans themselves. Uh, we have discovered quite a bit uh, in the way of treasures and documents, but we're not there yet. So let's start this journey. And we'll start it with uh, St. Augustine. <laughs> Augustine, uh, he lived from 354 to 430 CE. Now, without question, Augustine was one of the most famous converts to Manichaeism. This is a, a good way to start because Augustine, yeah, the, the, the one that uh, wrote, uh, uh, you know, the, the City of God, you know, the one who wrote the Confessions, uh, we know from his own work, the Confessions, as well as other works, that he was a convert to Manichaeism. Uh, he accepted this belief system while living uh, in North Africa. Uh, now, he says that he was a, a maniche, <laughs> he says, uh, for nine years. But taking a look at his texts, it appears that it wasn't nine years. He was uh, a convert to Manichaeism for about 11 years. So this is somebody who did leave the space system, but still was a part of it. That means he was immersed in aspects of it. And we have discovered even with the newly discovered works uh, that are connected to Manichaeism, that uh, yeah, his, his perceptions were correct. So he was right, partially. It's kind of like cherry picking. He's taking what he wants to make his point, but he is correct in these observations. It just, he doesn't go into the detail, nor does he uh, highlight all the good parts. Uh, so as you would expect, because uh, he has an idea in mind. Okay, so so he was a, he was a, at this point uh, he explains that the Manichaeans uh, have two basic orders. Now we know now that there's more orders, but two basic orders. Uh, the first group are called the Hearers, and that's the lower order. The second group of Manichaeans were called the Elect. It's the higher order. 
So he states as follows. And I'm quoting Augustine here. He says, the hearers eat meat and cultivate lands. And if they wish, have wives, none of which things is allowed to the elect. It should be far, but that's the way the translation is. Uh, so, so basically, if you are a hearer, uh, you, according to him, uh, you can get married, you can eat meat, uh, but um, and do regular jobs. But if you are the elect, you can't uh, be married. In fact, uh, he continues, the hearers go on their knees before the elect, humbly begging the imposition of their hands. So they go before these specially selected uh, individuals uh, who are uh, vegetarians. We'll learn more about them later. They join them, he says, in adoring and praying to the sun and praying to the moon. They fast with them on Sundays. So you, you have two different ranks. You have the hearers who are very much part of this world, uh, and you have uh, the elect who are not. Uh, you know, in many ways, this uh, reminds me of the Cathar division that you see. Uh, uh, the Cathars obviously were the group there was a, a, a crusade against them, right? You know, 11, 1200s, innocent, the third, and all that fun stuff. Anyway, uh, they had the same kind of divisions, which is fascinating, right? Is there a connection? Uh, possibly because uh, both the Cathars and the Manichaeans were also a very dualistic. So, yeah, yeah, there could be. Now, Augustine said that he was attracted to Manichaeism because they offered him more concrete reasons to believe rather than simple faith. <laughs> so uh, later, as a Christian, he asserted that the irony was that he was actually, it was actually reason that kept him from fully committing himself to uh, the Manichaean faith. Uh, it says on his, on the usefulness of believing work. So, uh, so it's interesting because he, he came to this because because the Manichaeans claim that they have, it's not, we're not just a faith um, focused belief system. We have real enlightening proof, experiential that you can know uh, for a fact. And he was wanting that, he was craving that. However, when the famous Manichaean teacher by the name of Faustus of Olivus could not, could not answer all of his questions, Augustine began to have his doubts um, concerning this belief system. He says as follows. He says, I held back my heart from all ascent, fearing to fall headlong, and I perished all the more from the suspense of judgment, so that I should be certain. I wished to be made as sure of the things I could not see, as I was certain that seven and three make ten. So they did not give him uh, the, the complete pragmatic answers that he was desiring. As for the God of the Hebrew Bible of the Old Testament, Augustine claimed that the Manichaeans thought that these teachings uh, uh, did, uh, did not come uh, from the all-high God. That uh, the Hebrew Bible, uh, it basically, he says, they say that the law given by God's servant Moses was not given by the true God, but by the prince of darkness, he says, in his epistola uh, uh, 236 two. So he's saying, you know, they do embrace the God of the New Testament, but they reject uh, the God of the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament, saying it's not the same God. Uh, that in many cases, it's the, the spirit that we oppose, that they're in opposition to one another. Augustine does not talk much about the prophet Manny himself, but he did note that they appeared to honor him in many ways, and he was a little bit uh, concerned because he believed that they honored him over that of Jesus. And Jesus was just considered, he says, one of their prophets. Now, I want to tell you this. Uh, Jesus is not just one of their prophets. So this is something 
that uh, Augustine gets wrong. <laughs> it's not just the prophet. Uh, it's it's so, and we're going to see that as we go through uh, this talk. So here, uh, Augustine is misinforming, intentionally misinforming his audience. Uh, but anyway, but he does. Uh, he he says that, that they barely celebrate the passion of Jesus Christ, but he says that they do honor the death of Mary. Now, I want to say that uh, uh, maybe. His particular branch focused more on Manny, but um, uh, we know from the primary sources, from the Manichaeans themselves, uh, not only do you have Jesus in their belief system, you have three different versions of Jesus. <laughs> so, oh well. Um, he says as follows, though, at the time I was a here amongst you, I often asked why the Pascha, or the passion of the Lord was generally kept with no solemnity at all or if at all, quite coldly, and, and by only a few, with no vigil, with no lengthy fast enjoined upon the hearers, with no festival array, while your bima, uh, the bima is the, the, the seat that is within the, uh, with, within the, the, the church where the bishop would sit. Uh, it's, so it's, in the, it's, you know, down the nave, right? So we have right in front there, right? That's the Bema. So he says, while your Bema, that is the day which Manichaeus was killed, you mark with great honor the setting up of a platform approached by five steps, covered with precious hangings, an open object to all. And that is true. So they did have a special honor uh, to, to, to Manny, uh, in which the Bema, in which this uh, the, the seat that is in, in front of, of the, the, the assembly area was decorated with precisely five steps. So that is, that is good. In fact, uh, the number five is very sacred to the Manichaeans. And we'll go into this. It's fascinating because in many cases, four is considered the dark side. <laughs> number and five is considered the light side. Don't worry, we'll go there. As far as their cosmology is concerned, obviously continues, he says that, quote, that they consider all souls, not only of men, but even beasts to be of the substance of God and altogether part of God. Yes, that is true. So we'll learn uh, that um, the Manichaeans do believe that there is this, this soul, this special spirit and soul, not only within humans, but within animals. What he does not bring up is they believe the same is true with plants uh, and also infused in nature in general. So there is this sense of animism there within this belief system. He says now this good and true God he says, entered into conflict with the races of darkness, which, which part is defiled all the world over. Uh, this, this is true, he's correct, but is purified by the meals of the elect and by the sun and the moon, while any portion of deity which it has been found impossible thus to purify is bound with an everlasting bound of punishment uh, to the end of the world. Okay, so yes, there are meals for the elect. Uh, he fails to mention the baptisms as well. So there are ritual baptisms that are involved too for purity. So anyway, I can see realize that much of the teachings of Manny, including those related to cosmology, um, should be taken literally. So um, he says that. So you preach especially that Manny came last for this reason, not to speak in figures, but to explain them, so that having unlocked the figures of the ancients by his narrations and the clear light of his arguments, he should be hidden by no figures. You added this reason for his presumption that clearly the ancients who saw, spoke, or enacted figures knew that he would come last and by him all would be explained. So, uh, you know, everything 
and the, the mysteries would be revealed, right? The speaking, you know, so the symbols and that which that presides behind the symbols will be uh, the cipher. He, he continues, he, however, knowing that no one would come after him, will no allegorical obscurities into his teaching. But he says, but, you know, uh, he's kind of matter of fact. <laughs> you know, he's, he's, he's not as mysterious, he says, as uh, he claims to be. But I would, again, tend to disagree. And once again, I think Augustine here is playing for his audience. So, but, um, and of course, um, there's another reason why he didn't like the Manichaeans, and it's for a reason you would not expect. Uh, uh, you see, the Manichaeans were upset because uh, they believed in marriage, if you're a hearer. And he wasn't married, he actually had a concubine. By the way, he had a concubine throughout much of, of his ministry. Yeah, you're, you're like, what? Really? Yeah. <laughs> you're learning something. So I'm going to reserve that for the Augustine talk later on. So uh, if you don't you want to learn quickly, let's read his confessions and go on. But he, he thought that he was not, he was living in sin. Uh, and so therefore he was not fully approved. So he eventually declares the Manichaeans as arrogant fools, very carnal and guerrillous, in whose mouths were the devil's snares and the bird lime concocted with additions to syllables of your name, and the Lord Jesus Christ, and the paraclete, our comfort of the Lord, uh, Holy Spirit. Anyway, so he, he just kind of dribbles off, gets angry. It's, because the Manichaeans, uh, it was uh, uh, looked down upon him. <laughs> That's it. It's like, okay. So we have another source, Evodius, a bishop of Uzelis. Uh He was a he was a friend of um, Augustine around, uh, you know, from Milan, around 385, and he wrote a work against the Manichaeans, but this work is it's really highly polemical, uh, where he states that, quote, the souls which had allowed themselves to be seduced from their former light nature and love of the world became enemies of the sacred life. And they armed themselves openly for the destruction of the sacred elements and gave themselves up obediently uh, to the spirit of fire while their hostile persecution of the Holy Church and its elect did evil unto the adherents to the heavenly commandments were shut out of the blessedness and glorified state of the sacred earth. So he doesn't like it. <laughs> so you get that idea. As a, uh, so uh, he's part of the, uh, we, we don't, we're the, we're the Manichaean bashing group. Uh, Augustine has another contemporary who's better. Thank goodness. Uh, his name is Epiphanius of Salamis, although he's problematic a lot, uh, but uh, I prefer him over Augustine any day. Uh, 315 when it comes to Manichaeism. 315 to 403, his lifetime, because he actually quotes from a Manichaean who stayed a Manichaean. Uh, this person's name is Turbo. Just think of turbocharge. Uh, you'll never forget his name. <laughs> so, and he provides a more clear summary of Manny's beliefs. Now, remember, um, I am going through these early uh, church Christian documents because this will be the perception of Manichaeism throughout, even into the 19th century, even into the 20th century. In many cases, people still, the 21st century, hold on to these views. So, so we have to deal with the perception. So let's deal with these sources, and then we'll get on with some other ones. So this is pretty good. Epiphanius, uh, he writes, he, meaning Manny, uh, worships two ingenerate, self-originate, eternal gods. Right? Dualistic. The one opposed to the other. Okay, so maybe, maybe a god and a spirit, the god of light, spirit of darkness, very much, very Zoroastrian. Uh, he presents one as good, he says, and the other as evil. Yeah, that's correct. Assigning to the first, the name of light, and the second, darkness. The soul in human beings is part of the light, the soul is part of the light, while the body and the material creation 
is of the darkness. You're feeling not only Zoroastrianism here, but you're feeling Gnosticism, right? He compares the two gods, the two kings, fighting one another, who have always been enemies, and each of whom possesses his own territory. But the darkness emerged from its own region, crossed the boundary, and attacked and battled with the light. That is also very true, according to the Manichaean uh, writing. So all of a sudden, darkness attacks the light. The good father, however, knowing that the darkness was sojourning in his land, emitted from himself a power called a mother of life. Right. He emitted the first man, and he put on the five elements. The five elements, in this case, being Wind, light, water, fire, and air. I know, where's earth? <laughs> and why is wind and air separate ones? But we'll go there, right? We'll go there. But I want to say that he is absolutely correct. Epiphanius of Salamis is 100% correct on this. He got it. He gets an A. <laughs> Augustine. I don't think I'll tell you what you got, but uh, it's not an A or a B or, or a C or a D. Okay, so that leaves a E. <laughs> e. I don't know. Enough. All right. So anyway, accordingly, according to Epiphanius, as a result of this invasion of darkness, particles of light eventually became trapped within the matter of this world requiring an act of liberation to return the light to the heavens via the cosmic ladder of the Milky Way. We'll talk about this cosmic ladder in a little bit, but he again, or excuse he's right. So you got these particles of light trapped in the material realm. Once again, wow, this is pretty Gnostic. It sure is. <clears throat> now those rising to the rank of the elect devoted their entire lives towards freeing these particles of light from within themselves through the abstinence of meat, which is, of course, laden with those fleshly enticements, right? And from sexual intercourse. So as, why? Because you're going to scatter that light further on. If you if you have you know, particles of light in you and it's enmeshed in your evil material flesh, <clears throat> if you uh, procreate, if you're the elect, you're just spreading the seeds of that, those particles of light further uh, and being further enmeshed in the material realm. So, he's, you know, that's why they're the beginning of the end when it comes to the answer to release those particles. So through them, through the elect, um, you know, the particles can return, right? Uh, now, violence, of course, against any living thing, which is strictly forbidden, uh, that, by the way, is inclusive, not just of animals, but of plants. Don't be violent towards plants and vegetables. You did you know at one point, uh, Manny describes the tortured cries uh, of uh, arising from plants after they've been cut. He says, you know, uh, these plants, when you cut them, they cry out. Plants feel pain, that it's, it's, it's cruel. Uh, because of this prohibition, many of those who follow Manichaeism at this time uh, uh, only ate fruit had fallen from the trees. Not all, just, you know, definitely not all, but there's a group that says, hey, you know what? <laughs> we can't eat the fruit, no, it falls to the trees because we forget, ah, we're causing uh, pain uh, to the, the tree. So uh, that means that they're, uh, I don't know, uh, eating lots of, of, lots of melons. <laughs> you know? uh, and of course, uh, they eat lots of bread. So they got a lot of carbs going on there with them, right? They're carb diet. So there you have it. Uh, but anyway, the, the, uh, we know that also that the elect spent most of, most of their time uh, spreading their message, you know, studying and meditating. Uh, so there it is. And, um, um, and they kind of wandered about, you know, sharing the message. They always have a, a situated home. 
they were supported by the hearers. So the hearers supported them. And of course, obviously, uh, Augustine was one of them. Uh, naturally, of course, the hearers had one basic hope, uh, and that is, well, they want to be reincarnated as the elect of the next life. So that's the idea. So you can be a hearer, enjoy this life, you know, be married, um, and eat meat, you know, maybe just, you know, eat the plants, <laughs> uh, the fruit off the trees. But as uh, uh, soon as uh, you, uh, uh, when you die, the hope is because they're serving the elect, that their good works, what they do, will be that they'll reincarnate as the elect. And at that point, they're not. So you can picture the hearer saying, well, guess what? I'm enjoying life now. When I die, when I come back, I'm going to be the elect. And no more fun for me. <laughs> uh, so there you have it. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, only one early Western form of Manichaeism professed that the good father sent his son, who was transformed into a human form, without actually becoming flesh, to help save the soul of light from the arc on powers of darkness. Uh, we have, that, that idea does spread, uh, this particular form. <clears throat> it gets as far as China, so that's as far as you can prefer to get in, in the age times. Again, Turbo, as a, this is, this is we're, we're still dealing with Epiphanes and Salamis and quoting Turbo. Turbo relates the son, quote, fashioned this salvation of souls, by creating a device, here, this is so interesting, create a device having 12 buckets turned by the sphere and drawing up the souls of the dying. So you have this, 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 there's this, there's this kind of this wheel, right? It's, it has 12 buckets on it. Got it? Like a Ferris wheel. What up? And what it's doing with each bucket, it is filled with the, the light particles of these souls. And it goes up and it says, these, the great luminaries take hold of with its rays, purifies them and gives, gives them over to the moon. And in this way, the moon's orb is filled up. So what does that mean? So you got the, so you have this little Ferris wheel with the buckets on it. You're like my sound effect. <laughs> you put up, you know, light souls, and then the rays, you know, of the luminaries are purifying it further, and, it, and it, it dumps it, it dumps these buckets onto the moon. And that's why the moon gradually becomes lighter, and more and more light. Okay? So it's being filled up with light. You can see where we're going with this, right? Then what happens is when the moon is quite full, it ferries them across the east winds and so begins to wane as it lightens its cargo. <laughs> so, so it's like, so, so wait, wait, so wait, how does this work again? So, uh, yeah, this is, of course, uh, fashioned by the sun. So basically it's, uh, you know, collecting the, the souls of light do, 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 you know, being purified, you know, it's going up, it's going up, it's going up, there you go, it goes to the moon, it ups the light, of course, the, the moon becomes more and more light, and then it gets to a certain point, and it goes, it goes okay, I have to move the light beyond, and it, so then it starts to, the, the wind blows, it, and it fades away, and it repeats, I guess, every month, <laughs> well, every lunar, you know, so uh, anyway, um, <laughs> you're never going to forget this, this imagery there. So there you have it. Okay. A Manichaeism uh, incorporated just enough Christian characteristics to be considered a Christian heresy. So many thought this is a Christian heresy. Non Christian sources, uh, that information concerning Manichaeism remains virtually one sided. So the no fault documents. Uh, provided uh, a perspective of one of the worshipers for a very long time. All this began to change. So here we go. So what you just heard is the perception of Manichaeism. It starts to change in 1865 with the publication of 
Abu Faraj Muhammad Ibn Ishaq's article on Manny. Uh, this writer is known as the bookseller, and uh, he was uh, he was a uh, a famous encyclopedist and biographer from the ninth century Baghdad. So for the ninth century, but what happens is uh, is that this work then becomes accessible to the Western world uh, in 1865. So it gets translated, right? So Gustav Hugo published and translated this article on Manny's religion. So basically, uh, 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 Abu Faraj Muhammad Ibn uh, Ishaq's uh, in the, uh, writing back in the ninth century, the 800s of Baghdad, uh, who knew, of course, obviously, Manichaeism, that information that gets published in 1865. Now, by the late 19th century, the work of Theodore Bartholdi were added to the scholarship of Manichaeism. Uh, he was a historian bishop from Kashgar, which is present-day Iraq. And so, and we also have, at uh, uh, this point, going into to certain scholars, uh, Manny's cosmology is quoted by uh, Severus, the Monophysite Bishop of Antioch. So uh, we get uh, more sources there. Uh, he was uh, right between 465 to 538. So we're, we're getting some sources, but still, it's not a lot, right? So things start to change, though, when we get to the 20th century. The biggest discovery of Manichaean texts uh, we hear from directly from the adherents uh, arise from Turfan. Turfan, where's Turfan? It's it's China. What? Yeah, Manichaean writings from China. Um, and there's four expeditions uh, that occurred between 1902 and 1914. Yeah, Turfan Basin uh, was located around the oasis. Uh, that uh, was along the Silk Route, uh, and uh, it was once uh, the realm of the Gushi Kingdom until conquered by the Chinese around 107 BCE. And it was obviously held during the Han, uh, Han Dynasty. The Shan Yu invaded it a few times with the fall of the Han Dynasty. Uh, the region became another independent uh, kingdom. Uh, during this period of time, Iranian people from Sogdia, which is basically Tajikistan and Uzbekistan today, arrived in the Turfan Basin. These are Iranian peoples. And then a Turkish tribe also moves in uh, to the area between, uh, ruled the area between 487 to 554. So you got basically, you got uh, Turks there, uh, you got Iranians there in what is now China. And they set up camp there. It's perfect when it comes to uh, the trade routes going back and forth. Now, uh, what will happen, is, this is important. So even though it seems like me, my minutia, but the Mongol Ruran Kaganite then takes over. Uh, and then the, the Goat Turks take over. Now in 640, the Tang Dynasty conquered this area. And uh, then Tibetan control starts in 792. Why is the Tibetan aspect important? Well, the Tibetan, uh, those from, uh, becomes part of kind of Tibet a little bit. In 792, they start, they start a habit. It's a habit of clothing corpses made out of discarded paper. So we discover that uh, some of the paper that they wrap these corpses with, like a like fish, <laughs> uh, in, in Turfan, um, happen to be, that's right, ancient texts. And what kind of texts? Well, many of these are Manichaean texts. Ah, now you're going, okay, there's a reason why. Yeah, so uh, this is kind of tradition uh, helped a lot. So what happens now is, is that um, the first expedition, it was sponsored by uh, Berlin's Koniglisch uh, Museum. Um, uh, and, um, and so the, basically the Germans arrive and when they get there, uh, they start digging amongst the ruins and they, uh, around the inner wall and they came upon a beautiful frescoed floor and, uh, they looked at the 
the walls of this what looks like a cella, like a like a, like a, a small little meditation room or something of the sort. They looked and they saw part of the upper body of a white robed priest with a rectangular hat. And so um, and they, they thought that was interesting. And so then they moved to another part of the site. Uh, but what happened is, is that when they moved to the, at another part of the site, you had the local inhabitants. They, they go around like, ooh, this is pretty cool. You guys discovered this uh, interesting fresco, these mosaics. And they start digging around. And you know what they found? They found manuscript fragments uh, in the passageways around the cella. Uh, and they found even what contained a, a miniature of a white robe man resembling the one in the fresco. And so, of course, they stumbled upon a, yes, a manuscript depository. And they start clearing up the rubble-filled rooms. And yes, they found these texts in Uber Turkish, a well uh, buried or hand copied. Uh, there were Buddhist texts, there were uh, secular documents, but there were also Manichaean works. And this was a very exciting moment. And there was a second Turfan expedition. Uh, they, you know, boy, hey, you know, this is going to, first one was successful. Let's go for the second one. Uh, so, again, uh, this is between November 1904 to August of 1905. And they found, again, um, uh, more more materials. Um, but, unfortunately, uh, this is really sad. It turned out that a lot of the materials were destroyed. The worst part of it is they were recently destroyed. As they're sifting through, what had happened? Uh, is that uh, uh, you had uh, within within a few years earlier they had uh, rerouted some of the irrigation canals and changed the water table and the water table rose a little bit as a result of that and it turned all of these manuscripts into mush, louse, and awful. And <laughs> as they're going through this mush, they found the corpse of a murdered Buddhist monk. Uh, you know, this ritual robe all stained with blood. You know, archaeology uh, can be gross and it can be disturbing. <laughs> can you imagine, though? But very sad, too. It's like all of this loss, it lasted all these centuries and only for it to be destroyed uh, just, a, just a little earlier period of time, uh, just a few years earlier. If not, even, uh, they, there's even claims that they had arrived uh, and dug here the year before, they could have saved it. But now, they, uh, it, it, everything uh, stuck together. It was a, ter a terrible heat of the unusual summer there. It made it even worse. Uh, they, tried to dry, they tried to dry them out, but they crumbled. You know what they should have done, because we have modern techniques now, they should have just saved them, and, but they didn't know, and wait for a day where we could figure out and unravel these. So that was that was rather sad. There was two others uh, that followed after this expedition. You have the third one, uh, 1905 to 1907. Uh, and uh, this one was amazing. Uh, they found so much in the way of, of, of materials, that, you know, that, um, well, uh, the collection was packed in 118 crates. Uh, so that's, and of course, there's a fourth one as well. So uh, one of the great discoveries in 1907 was the Cave of a Thousand Buddhas. Uh, the entrance uh, to this cave temple had been, had been blocked by fallen rock and, and debris and, and drift sand. Uh, but uh, so, so it took a long time to work their way in. Uh, it was at the foot of a, of a cliff as well. So they moved into the antechamber and they, they noticed a crack in the fresco wall of, the pa of a passageway. As they moved open that passageway, just like Indiana Jones, ah, that's right, manuscripts. It's, so this is exciting. Wouldn't, you, wouldn't it be great to be in a position where you're going through, uh, you know, this, you know, going through a cave or a grotto or, you know, and then all of a sudden there's a little crack and you, you move through the crack and there's an ancient library there's all this information. Well, this actually does happen. 
Uh, this is reality. So, wow. So now all of a sudden, we got Manichaean texts. <laughs> it's Manichaean Palooza, right? So exciting time. Now, we can confirm what is true and, and what is not, so to speak. So let, let, let's, let's go to it, right? So uh, one work called the uh, Kephalea of Manny uh, was uh, a, a major text. Um, actually, this one, um, this discovery happened in the 1920s. So, so we have more. Anyway, um, in every way, well, as we look at these documents, now we're dealing with, that's right, we're dealing with Manichaeism as understood by the Manichaeans. I like this a lot. So in every way, Manny attempted to make his belief as ecumenical as possible. Um, I like this quote from Han Jonas. Um, Han Jonas is a Gnostic scholar uh, because he really does kind of hit the nail on the head. He says, in one respect, Manny's uh, Catholicity went beyond the Christian model, whether for the sake of universal appeal or because of his many-sided affiliations. He made doctrinal basis of his church as synchristic as was compatible with the unity of the central Gnostic idea. In principle, he recognized the genuineness and the provisional validity of the great earlier revelations. In practice, in the first attempt of its kind in recorded history, he deliberately fused Buddhist, Zoroastrian, and Christian elements with his own teaching. So that not only could he declare himself to be the fourth and concluding prophet in a historical series, and his teaching as the epitome and consummation of that of his predecessors, but his mission could in each of the three areas dominated by the respective religious traditions emphasize that aspect of the Manichaean synthesis which was familiar to the minds of his hearers. He is intentionally seeing himself as this final prophet. Now, why, why would I find this interesting? Because you're going to have the same kind of concept later on with Islam as pertaining to Judaism and Christianity, as being the final revelation, as being the final prophet, as being the final seal. So you're seeing already that there is this precedent that is already uh, there uh, in the ancient Middle East in Manny, who is this prophet, right? So I think that's fascinating. Okay, so Manny, we now know, of course, now we, we, we've deciphered all this. So Manny, he did live in Babylonia uh, during the 3rd century BCE. Uh, during the era of the Sassanid Empire. Um, and, uh, you know, we don't know, you know, there's, there's kind of fights about uh, which town he is from. It's contested. Uh, some have him at uh, Meridini near Babylonia. Uh, uh, but anyway, um, some say he's from Abruma. Don't worry about this. Amani's father was a certain Atik, which is a Middle Persian name, and, and uh, in, in Iran. While his father was Persian, his mother, Miriam, uh, seemed to be from an Armenian family. But yet he was raised as a Jewish Christian. And we know he was raised as an Elkasite. An Elkasite. What is an Elkasite? Like Elka Seltzer? I mean, what is that? Well, we know all, now, now that we have this link, to the Elkasite, Manny the Elkasite, now we can put together some of his earlier influences. So the Elkasites uh, seem to be an earlier source or an inspiration for him. Uh, by the way, um, so who are the Elkasites? Okay, well, we do know the Elkasites from ancient times. This is uh, uh, very much, uh, some say it goes back to the Essenes. It is a form of Jewish Christianity. Uh, so we're not now we're not talking about Manichaeism, but we are. So the Elkasites, once again, he was raised as an Elkasite. 
And that means aspects of this belief will go into his belief. So let's talk about the Alcocytes. Alcocytes, according to Hippolytus of Rome, uh, a certain Alcibiades of Apamea, identified as a Jewish Christian, like Elskalsus, arrived in the internal city, that being Rome, during the papacy of Calixtus I, that's 217 to 222, and presented a book that contains a revelation received by Elkasai by way, so now, so, so now he's arriving with a revelation, by way of an angel 96 miles high. Wow, oh, 96 miles high, 60 miles broad, and 24 across the shoulders, and whose footprints were 14 miles long and four miles wide by two miles deep. You know, I thought, you know, my, you know, I thought my feet were big, but, um, you know, I'm <laughs> size 13, but uh, hey, you know, uh, this, this angel has me. Because, uh, you know, when you have a, a four mile by two mile uh, <laughs> foot size, like <laughs> uh, this one wins. Yeah. This angel revealed himself as none other than the son of God. And his sister arrived, who is the Holy Spirit, who is of the same size. So uh, basically, uh, uh, you have the son and the spirit. They arrived. Uh, they're, they're they're kind of tall, you know. You know, I, I think uh, if you see an angel or uh, the sun who's ninety six miles high, I, I guess you maybe would notice that. I don't understand. Anyway, quite a revelation there. But um, anyway, so Alcibiades proclaimed that this revelation came about during the third year of the Emperor Trajan. Well, it's Emperor Trajan. Uh, he came to rule in 98, so 99, 100, so 100 uh, CE. There's his revelation, which focused upon baptism as being able to literally wash away sins, even those of the worst offenders. So it is a baptismal cult, uh, just like that. So, uh, yeah, so only S, yes, yes, Margie, yes. Yeah, not 100 miles high. Just 96, yeah, four miles short, you know. <laughs> Thank you for that comment, right? Uh, you know, tolerate bad jokes. Ooh, tolerate these jokes are bad. Okay, so anyway, it was it was very much a baptismal cult. Uh, and so uh, obviously uh, there's lots of criticism. Uh, so there was a first baptism that goes for purity. Second baptism was believed to be effective against all sins of impurity. Hippolytus notes sins of intercourse of any kind, uh, intercourse with animals uh, or with, with sisters or daughter or committing adultery or being guilty of fornication or whatever it is. All that is raised in second baptism. And by baptism, let him be purified and cleansed and let him endure for himself those seven witnesses that have been described in this book. I'm quoting now from the book um, of the Alchemists. Uh, heaven and the water, the Holy Spirit, the angels of prayer, the oil, the salt, and the earth. Yeah, so yeah, it's an interesting belief system. Um, you know, there's 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 lots of cures for various things, because, you know, uh, I think one thing is, is that uh, you got to be careful of even possessed dogs. <laughs> so, uh, so um, you know, so it's, they're, they're, they're worried about these. Uh, apparently, in, in ancient times, I guess it's the idea of, of rabies, they're not quite. They don't quite understand the concept, and so they think that this is some kind of a demon of possession. So the alkacites uh, have a remedy for that. Uh, if a dog, rabid and furious, in which adheres a spirit of destruction, by any man or woman or youth or girl, or may worry or touch them, in the same hour, let such a one run. With all their wearing apparel, okay, I get that. Okay, so I'm going to run and go down to a river or to a fountain wherever there is a deep spot. Let him or her be dipped with all their wearing apparel and offer up supplication to the great and most high God in faith of heart 
and then let him thus adjure seven witnesses described in this book. So that's the cure. Uh, so you will be possessed. And of course, it says, uh, Behold, I call to witness the heaven and the water and the holy spirits and the angel of prayer and the oil and the salt of the earth. Guess what? That's seven. Yeah. And I testify by these seven witnesses that, that no more shall I sin, nor commit adultery, nor steal, nor be guilty of injustice. So there you have it, right? But anyway, um, but in, um, also, uh, you, you got to make sure that you're dipped in cold water. Uh, that's important, too, especially when it comes, it comes to uh, co consumption. And you have to do that, you know, um, 40 times during seven days. So there's there's interesting things. There's there's obviously a focus also on uh, wicked stars. There exist wicked stars of impiety. The OU pious ones and disciples beware of power of the days of the sovereignty of these stars and engage not in the commencement of any undertaking during the ruling days of those and baptize not men or women during the days of the power of these stars with the moon emerging from amongst them courses the sky and travels along with them beware the very day up to the bat on which the moon passes out of these stars so yeah so there's basically uh, there's a lot of astrology involved this does carry over uh to manichaeism uh, and also there's lucky and unlucky days. So this is the kind of the belief system that he grew up with. So uh, it's a Jewish Christianity, but it has lots of qualifications, as you can see. Um, then, of course, um, uh, you have you have also another belief system, and that is Bardassian. It's, the, it's believed that uh, the beliefs of the Syrian Bardassian also helped influence Manichaeism. Uh, now, Barthi, uh, Bardassian, he was born in, in Odessa in 154. Uh, this is a city that was very much of the cultural crossroads between Rome and Parthia. Uh, and Bardassian, uh, basically, uh, he was raised in the house of a local uh, Babylonian priest. He learned all about Babylonian astrology and other aspects of this ancient belief system. Later on, <laughs> At the age of 25, Bardassian converted to Christianity, uh, and uh, so he's a Christian. But Bardassian sought to bring his own Babylonian ideas and beliefs in harmony with Christianity and brought along Gnostic and magical ideas. So uh, he, this is an attempt to harmonize. You can see how this could influence uh, later Manny, Manny, you know, is the way, you know, maybe I could be synchronistic as well. So uh, a Bardassian, who was still viewed as a Christian, he denied an actual physical resurrection, but believed in a spiritual ascent. This idea would be adopted by Manny. As for the origins of the world, he viewed that it was created via a process of emanations arriving from the supreme God, proclaimed as the father of the living. Those emanation. And yes, Manny would adopt this idea. He believed that the father of the living joined with the mother of life. Yes, Manny would adopt this. Who is the Holy Spirit who gave birth to the son of the living? He does adopt the idea of the son of the living. Uh, from here, the emanation of the Pleroma, we know more other gods or lesser spirits, including a Sophia who does indeed fall. He doesn't have fallen Sophia, however, in his beliefs, uh, but he does he has all the rest. Uh, Bardassian is known especially for his collection of 150 hymns or songs. Uh, and uh, he, of course, obviously, he adapted this to the Syriac tongue. A few fragments of his works do survive. Uh, one referring to paradise and making it clear that his theology was inclusive of both the divine father as well as a divine mother who is understood as the Holy Spirit. In fact, he writes, Thou fountain of joy, whose gate by commandment opens wide to the mother, which beings divine have measured and founded, which father and mother in their union have sown, with their steps have made fruitful, 
So you do and have a sense that that creation is made not just by a man, <laughs> by a male aspect, but a male and female aspect. Yes, this crosses over to men. Another fragment of the Saul of Barbassia is preserved by Ephraim. Talks about the Divine Mother, who is the Holy Spirit, is portrayed as addressing her two daughters, the Sophia of the Pleroma and Sophia. It says, let her who comes after thee to me be a daughter, a sister for thee. A third fragment is part of an address that uh, is focused upon the Divine Mother, the Holy Spirit, alone. What at length shall be ours to look on at thy banquet? See thy young maiden, the daughter thou settest, only thy knee and carest. So this psalm refers to the consummation of the world process, when the spiritual soul shall be taken from the unknown uh, in the Pleroma and made one with the divine spouses of the great wedding feast. So, uh, so basically you have this idea of being reunited with divine spouses. Now this is fascinating because this idea of divine spouses uh, does go into Islam. <laughs> so, wow, you're, this is all, anyway, it's so interesting. Anyway, um, there are Parnassian works on fate and astrology do survive. Uh, he says that uh, uh, it has been said by me in another place that the soul of man is capable of knowing that which many do, uh, do not know. And the same men meditate to do, and all that they do wrong, and all that they do good, and all the things which happen to them in riches and in poverty, and in sickness and in health, and in defects of the body, it is from the influences of those stars, which are called the seven, that befall them, and they're governed by them. So once again, you have the stars being in charge, having power over us. So, but ultimately... He says that everything is not in our free will. Uh, that is, our free will is not absolute, is plainly visible by everyday experience. So he talks about, yeah, that the fortune uh, has power too. In essence, Bardassia makes free will, fate, and nature the three factors connected to this karmic law of action, all three being ultimately connected to God. Got it? So each reacts on each. None is absolute. Nature has to do with the body, fate or fortune with the soul, and free will with the spirit. None of them is absolute. The absolute being is God alone. So basically nature, the flesh, you know, uh, you know, it is it is bound to certain limits, right? But uh, fate is connected to the soul. However, you do have free will of the spirit. So, so he splits uh, soul and spirit. Now, what will happen is aspects of this are adopted by Manny. It, it is, but he we're, we're going to see that uh, this the split between soul and spirit really doesn't happen. This soul and spirit are viewed as one when it comes to uh, man. So you basically have this dualistic flesh, body, and, and soul-spirit aspect. So that's kind of what happens. Okay, so with all of these ideas, let's see, man becomes stern. Some say intellectually, others say mystically, right? And he decides to come up with a belief of his own that harmonized those that he knew and from his perspective transcended them all. First, of course, now at the age of 12 and then at the age of 24, Manny had a revelation in which he describes as the twin, identified as the living paraclete, compelled him to become a prophet of an entirely new religion based upon these Gnostic ideals. So, so, so can you imagine he has his epiphany first at 12 years of age and then at 24? You see, one's double for the other. He describes his epiphany in his uh, Kephalea. So I'm going to go ahead and describe his epiphany. Once again, uh, you have 
a prophet that has an epiphany. You know, you see this a lot, right? You see this, uh, the epiphanies of the prophets within Judaism, right? The epiphany by God, the ecstatic rapture that brings us up uh, to the heavens, right? And you see these epiph epiphany in, in, uh, with Zoroaster, you know, Zarathustra, right? In Zoroastrianism, right? Or, you know, who is the Maya, right? So, Mazdaia. So, the point of the matter is you have that epiphany. You have uh, an epiphany, of course, uh, with, um, uh, with, again, later on, Muhammad having an epiphany. So, uh, you have, of course, the epiphany within Sikhism. So, yeah. Okay, so here we go. So, this is a description. Here we go. So he, it says, he revealed, this, he's describing it here. Uh, this is Manny now. He revealed, to be the hidden mystery. Oh, wait, one thing. So now we do have writings. Hello, of Manny, because we thought we're all destroyed. Now we've discovered them, you know, 20th century, right? Okay. Um, he revealed to be the hidden mystery that was hidden from the world's generations. The mystery of the depth and the height. He revealed to be the mystery of the light and the darkness. The mystery of the conflict in the great war which darkness stirred up, he revealed to me how the light turned back or overcame the darkness by the intermingling and how, in consequence, was set up in this world. He enlightened me of the mystery of the tree of knowledge of which Adam ate, by which his eyes were made to see. The mystery of the apostles who were sent out into the world to select the churches. Thus was revealed to me by the paraclete all that has been and that shall be, and all the eye sees and the ear hears and the thought thinks. Through him, I learned to know everything. I saw the all through him, and I became one body and one spirit with him. Wow! Talk about complete! Uh, immersion, right? He's becoming one, you know, with God in a mystical moment. Now that is, right, that's, you know, in Christianity, uh, even Eastern Orthodoxy, uh, you can, you know, go through uh, a theosis, right? You know, you do this whole thing of, of opening yourself up, right? You open yourself up through apatheia, you open yourself up, this is a Greek's, and then, of course, through escasis, through this effort of opening up, you enjoy, of course, uh, theosis. You know, you start to divinization, divinization. You know, you're going through, um, you're becoming godlike. But then it's this area, you kind of circle around, but you never become it. You never become one with it. <laughs> you just you, you participate. And, you know the emanation, but never right there, right in the dark, right in the right in the target, right in the target. In the target. Well, guess what? Anichism, and he hit that target. He was there, you know. He saw it all for that moment. He was the all. So you see, and and the all is very inclusive of all things. Whew. Okay. So Manny began to spread his belief system, and he set out for, well, um, he sent two missionaries to Alexandria, Egypt. He then sent other missionaries to the Kuchum Kingdom, which is currently Afghanistan. And then around 240, 41, Manny decided to directly uh, go to India. And at first, he, by the way, he sailed there. He ended up in the Indus Valley, and uh, Manny managed to convert uh, Turan Chak, the Buddhist king uh, here, uh, to the Manichaean faith. And according to the Kephalaya, uh, Manny moved the whole land of India. <laughs> With the said, he prophesied that he would face forces that would diminish the position there because he was, and they, he did use this word, because he was too heavy. Yes, he does use the word heavy. I don't know. Uh, this sounds like something from the 1980s. You know, <laughs> everything heavy. Anyway, so but then with the ascent, uh, what happens then is that um, uh, we arrive, of course, back to the Sassanian Persia with Shapur, the first 241 to 272. 
Eddie was able to have an audience with the king who approved this new belief system. But unfortunately, uh, Zoroastrianism, which is very dualistic and has Gnostic aspects, is on its ascent. And as a result of that, there's, there's, there's a feeling of competition. You know Zoroastrianism, there's a lot of similarities. And as a result of that, when Bharam or Vara uh, comes to the throne in 273, uh, well, uh, the Zoroastrians pretty well take over uh, and manage to turn the king against the Manichaeans, and the persecutions begin. Manny, of course, is in prison, and he dies in 276. So there you have it. It's Manny's life. Now, uh, in general, Manichaeism possesses a general Gnostic outline with one, with the one who is the monad, known as the father of greatness or the father of light. The duality of light versus the darkness, of course, is there. There's the fall of the soul and the return again to the realm of light. Concerning the father of light, um, the father of light is not described anyway. Uh, yeah, he's the source of all things, but he is beyond all things. He's beyond. Uh, he's the unutterable. He is, he in fact, is described as, as being behind a veil. A, a veil, a penetral veil uh, that uh, you cannot uh, seem to move beyond, right? Uh, we have, of course, um, now what happens is that uh, he is, the father is invoked as the primeval ancestor. Uh, there it is. And so we have some hymns here that are dedicated to him. And I, I want to give you a taste of some of the hymns. Uh, the hymn of because now, because I have the hymns that I'll share with you, uh, the hymn of paradise and the father of greatness evokes the great, the father of greatness as well as attributes personified in nature. It goes as follows: The immortal, fragrant breeze, air, attends the gods together with the earth and its trees. The source of light, the blessed plants, the echoing bright mountains of divine nature are wonderful. The houses of the jewel gods is a place full of blossoms with countless lands, houses, and thrones. You are worthy of praise, highest king. Honor and praise to the Lord, Manny of good name. Blessed be on the great New Year's Day, the teacher Marzuka with the whole assembly of light. There you go. That's beautiful, right? So you can see it's very, he's, you know, you have the idea that this God, right, is is within nature. It's, it's it, you know, it's transcendent, imminent within nature. It's on all things, but all throughout nature. So you have this interesting connection. Now, another hymn uh, dedicated to the, the Great Father declares all the gods and deities were invoked and established by him. So there are other gods. So even though we say it's a dualistic system, you know, there's like a good God and a not so good spirit of, of darkness. Um, the, the reality is, is that there's still a polytheistic aspect of it. There is multiple gods. It says all the gods and deities were evoked and established by him. All rejoice in him and give him honor. The land of light by its five pure thoughts. We'll go back to that. It is fragrant with sweet smelling breezes. It shines in all the regions, powers, gods, and deities, jewels, joyful aeons, trees, springs, and plants rejoice in him every day. The five pure thoughts, by the way, correspond to the five limbs of the soul. Just remember that. So the again, the, uh, the five pure thoughts are the five limbs of the soul. So we, we have this idea, again, it's very... It's not just animistic, it's kind of pantheistic. <laughs> so, but still, with this central aspect, who is the great father. Now, of course, uh, there is a cosmogony. This, of course, explains uh, how the universe came about. There is an eschatology, which explains how the world will end. But the, the knowledge of the origins of the world and of man and of their present state and future destiny is part and parcel of that Gnostic idea of redemption. So basically, uh, man 
has lost his original true being. This occurred at the beginning uh, of time when the five sons of the first man, who are ultimately limbs uh, of his soul, succumb to the power of darkness. They rent away the soul and greedily devoured it, finally banishing it from the earthly body. And this dog is driving me crazy. <laughs> oh, you want attention. Sorry. <laughs> She's like begging to be held. It's like, um, okay. So now I got then I got dog in the lamp. So, um, but uh, there we go. So you don't want to go outside. You just want to bother me. Okay, so uh, I guess all these are included, right? Manichaeism. So, so, so Blueberry is a Manichaean uh, adherent. All right? Are you Manichaean? Right? You follow? Okay. All these are included with the trees and jewels, right? Okay. Um, now, for the Manichaeans, uh, there are three creations. There are three separate creations. Uh, so for the first creation, uh, originally good and evil existed in two completely separate realms. That's right. There was one was the world of light, ruled by the father of greatness, together with his five shekinahs. Five shekinahs, which are divine uh, attributes of light. And then the other world, was the world of darkness ruled by the king of darkness. Now, the king of darkness uh, is described. Here we go. Uh, he is a hideous demon. Um, uh, and we actually have a Parthian work known as the king of darkness in hell. And I'll go ahead and read that description. He's all, this is, this is the god of darkness, the hideous demon and the ugly form. He scorches. He destroys. He terrifies. He flies on wings as of air. He swims with fins as in water. And he crawls like a being of darkness. He is armed on his four limbs to repel the children of fire, rushing upon him like the beings of hell. Poisonous springs gush forth from him, and he exhales smoky fog. Watch out for that smoky fog. His claws and teeth are like daggers. They are beings of hell wrought upon a couch of darkness in lust and pursuit of desire. They give birth to each other and then destroy each other. The bellicose prince of darkness has subjected the five pits of death through great terror and wrath. He has spurted forth streams of deadly poison and wickedness from the depth. Wow, <laughs> lots of colorful language there, right? Uh, spurted forth streams. Ooh, okay, so at a certain point, <laughs> uh, uh, the kingdom of darkness notices the world of light. And he becomes greedy. And he attacks it. So the father of greatness in the first of these three creations, or calls, calls to the mother of light. Yes, the mother of light who then sends her son, who is the original man, Nasa Quadmaya, right, the Dermic, his original man, who is the primordial man, to battle with the attacking powers of darkness, which includes the, the demon of greed, right? So the original man, this original man, so basically you guys got this, you have the father of greatness, right? Uh, and then, of course, what happens is, is that uh, he calls to the mother of life, who then sends her son, the original man, to, uh, who is the primordial man to battle against this darkness. There's this battle going on, right? Okay. Well, what happens is this original man, this archetype, has five sons who are known as the five shikanas. Ah, there we go, the five shikanas. The first one. Uh, the first Shekinah, the first son is Ether. The second is Wind. The third is Light. The fourth is Water. And the fifth is Fire. Sound familiar? That's right. Now the original man is armed with the five different shields of life. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, of, of light. And these are reflections of the five Shekinahs. So he's fighting with the shield, but 
he loses to the force of darkness in the ensuing battle, uh, described as kind of a bait to trick the forces of darkness. So as, as he's sacrificing himself, oh no, you know, and as darkness starts to spread on him, he's trapped on these forces, you know, this ideal man who emanated from the great father of godness, uh, something happens. What happens? Well, what happens is he's rescued. He's rescued. We'll go there. So it says, the good God, the highest of the gods, a diadem of eternal glory, blissful amongst the lights, was proud and happy when you were born in his realm. The twelve sons of the Aeons and the Aeons and the vast bears were happy. All the gods and inhabitants of his realm, the mountains, trees, springs, and broad, strong palaces and halls were happy through you, friend. When the lovely women and girls born of the sense saw you, this is describing the ideal man, they praised you, blessed you, perfect youth. Songs filled the air, tambourine, harp, and flute exploded. Uh, I'm not sure about what the flute exploding, but there you have it. All gods stood before you, prince, son of a king. Voices ring from the vast air, songs from the light earth tell the father of light. Born in the battler who makes peace, the all good highest of the gods gives you three tasks. Destroy death, strike the enemies, and cover the whole paradise of light. You paid homage and went out for battle and covered the whole paradise of light. The tyrant prince was bound forever, and the dwelling place of the dark ones was destroyed. A light friend, primal man, remained until he carried out his father's will. Ooh, oh, there you go. That's pretty kind of cool. So there you have it. You know, this is this primordial uh, man. The story how the darkness took captive the light is told fully in the Parthian hymn known as the Captivity of Light. Uh, we will go there. Uh, here it goes. It says, uh, and, and by the way, uh, uh, it introduces uh, Pesus. And Pesus, P-E-S-U-S, this is the name of the female animal in the realm of darkness that gives birth to the first human pair. So you have the feminine aspect, which is above, and you have the feminine aspect that's below. You have the good one and you have the dark one. We already talked about the good one, talked about the bad one, right? Though the great kingdom of salvation waits on high, ready for those who have gnosis, right? they have knowledge, so that they may finally find peace there. Sinful dark curses runs hither and thither brutishly. She gives no peace at all to the upper and lower limbs of light. She seizes and binds the light in the six great bodies. Now, where are the six great bodies that the light is captured in? In earth, in water, and fire, and wind, and plants, and animals. Right? She fashions it in many forms. She molds it into many figures. She fetters it in a prison so that it may not ascend to the height. She weaves a net around it on all sides. She piles it up. She sets a watchman over it. Greed and lust are made its fellow captives. She mixes destructive air into those six great bodies. She nurtures her own body, both destroys their sons. The power of light on high confuse all demons of wrath. And the sons, that is, Pesis, who is the higher place. So she is the instigator. Uh, Pesis is the instigator of this cosmogony, being the dark active energy that causes this fall. The upper and lower limbs of light are the elements of light which emanate and then is captured by her to become the four elements of the earth. You know, so, so, so earth, air, fire, water, along with plants and animals thrown in. The particles of light will then shut up within the human body along with evil desires. The dark elements, of course, mirror the light elements as above, so below, one copying the other, combining the other, and dragging this light all the way down into the realm of darkness. All right. Okay. Well, so that's okay. So the story of the first man fights the powers of darkness. He eventually succeeds, as described uh, in the battle of the first man, right? Uh, then came the beneficent father with his brothers and saved his own light. So what happens is he's rescued. Yes. And so ends the first creation. But then we have the second creation. Then the father of greatness begins the second creation. 
calling to the living light who calls to his five sons. The living light, the living, uh, sorry, this, this uh, living uh, life, this living spirit was created as a result of a prayer made by the mother of, mother of life and the father of greatness. So the father of greatness and the mother of life, they pray together, and this becomes the living spirit, this living light, and it becomes a deity. In essence, the living spirit is that prayer made manifest and turned into a deity for the express purpose to rescue her fallen son, the primal man. So there it has it, right? So together, the living spirit, the five sons, send a call to the original man, as we talked about before. Uh, and what's interesting is this message. I want to say this. This message is called a call. So when the living spirit and the five sons send a call, the word call, this message, the word call becomes a message. So it becomes a God. What? Yes, it becomes a God. So, so when they call, when they call out to rescue, that it becomes a mannequin deity, and it becomes a sixth son of the living spirit, which is known as uh, as the one who watches and perceives sounds of the world. And this will be connected to the Chinese bodhisattva of compassion. Uh oh, we got Buddhism here. So call is sent from the living spirit to awaken the first man from his battle with the forces of darkness. And then there is an answer. The answer from this primordial spirit, and this becomes another deity. So call and response become gods. Wow. And so together, the living spirit with the six sons rescued the primal man. Uh, and so the living spirit caught him, took him to himself, freed him, set him up and release them into the realm and of rest. So the mother of life, the living spirit, and the five sons began to create the universe from the bodies of the evil beings of the world of darkness, together with the light that they have swallowed up. So, um, so each uh, five sons of the living spirit take on specific responsibilities uh, in, the, in the second creation, these five sons. The first uh, is the keeper of splendor. He holds up the ten heavens from above. Second son, the king of glory, becomes in charge of the earth treasury and is viewed as a Chinese bodhisattva. The third son is a goblet of light, fights with the overcomers uh, against, of course, the evil image of the king of darkness. The fourth son, the big king of honor, sits in the seventh heaven, guarding the world of light. Uh, and, and of the eighth, ninth, and tenth heavens, and so forth. And finally, this sun atlas supports the eight worlds from below. So, so the living spirit is, is in, any, in many ways acting as the demiurge, creating this universe. So you have these ten heavens, and eight earths are created. And you see this a lot in many Buddhist sims, uh, systems. So again, Buddhism is connecting here. All consisted of various pictures of evil materials from the world of darkness, and the swallowed light, the sun, the moon, the stars are all created from this light. So you still have this battle going on between the two. All right. So what will happen? I know we're we're short on time, but I want to make sure we cover this. The third creation. So it looks like everything is going to be good. You know, the, the 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 darkness is being gobbled up, but then we have another problem. The great demons are then hung out over the heavens as the great father uh, uh, the great father begins the third creation. The light is recovered from out of the material bodies of male and female evil beings and demons by causing them to become sexually aroused greed towards the beautiful images of the beings of light. But then what happens is there needs to be, uh, what happens is there's a kind of a rebellion and I don't want to go into this in detail because we have a, a lot of space to cover. I want to make sure we get through this. Is that, yeah, there's another problem. The problem is, is that uh, uh, you have another rebellion. However, as soon as the light is expelled from their bodies and falls to the earth, um, 
the evil beings continue to swallow up as much of it as they can. Uh, and, and so, and they keep the light inside of them. And this results eventually the evil beings swallowed up huge quantities of light, populated and producing Adam and Eve. What? We got the Adam and Eve here? Yeah, Adam and Eve. So the father of greatness then sends to Adam and Eve the radiant Jesus to awaken Adam to his true nature, to his true self, to his true soul that is enmeshed in his material body, and to, to enlighten him to the true source of the light that is trapped there. And so you have Jesus that is brought out to help that out. Okay, so you're thinking, okay, so now, so Jesus is there, right? In fact, what will happen is Jesus, uh, as a result of this, I know, is that you have different forms of Jesus. You actually will have eventually uh, three forms of Jesus that will appear over a period of time, each time enlightening us, uh, waking us up to the reality that we are strangers of the strange world and need to be brought forth. And by that recognition, uh, obviously being uh, free of the material world. And so you have this. So we have, of course, a few hymns here. Uh, one to the Jesus, the splendor to be honored. Uh, you have the hymn here, the living soul. Uh, now, what happens now uh, is, uh, is, of course, we have to go here, is, is basically is that now um, you have, um, oh, I'll just go there. So obviously the splinters of light that fell from above and that were incorporated into the material world were understood as the soul within humans and other beings, upon which the forces of darkness sought to capture as their own. So once it reaches these, those known as the elect, the elect, we talked about the elect, we're, we're kind of going full circle here, is purified. So what happens now is you got these, these particles of light that is amongst this realm. And, and, it's, 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 and so these particles of light will eventually reach one of the elect in Manichaeism. And as a result of the elect, they're the ones that purify, that purify and free these sparks of light to go back into the heavens. So the elect, it, how, they, how they do this purification process? Three steps. First of all, uh, this, this uh, light is purified from the material darkness uh, through the knowledge of where the soul actually came from. So the knowledge itself is important. Number two, it is purified by the very fact that the soul reached the body of the elect who are at the top rung of life. Right, so the fact that you just got there to these individuals, and finally purified number three through the ascetic actions they practice through through their asceticism, through their actions by staying away uh, from eating meat and, uh, and sexual intercourse and so forth by their actions, it does the purification. Back to the hymn to the living soul, it talks about this. It says meritorious and blessed is the auditor who gathers the soul together, and blissful is the elect who purifies it. This redeemed soul has come, it has come to this church of righteousness. Praise it forever, you elect, so that it may wondrously purify me and lead me to life. And of course, then there is the hymn uh, on the fate of the living soul. It says, I hail from the light and from the gods, Yet I have become as one banished, separate from them. The foes assembled above me and took me to the realm of death. Blessed be he who rescues my soul from distress so that it may be saved. A God am I, born of the gods, a bright, radiant, shining, beaming, fragrant, and beautiful God. But now I have fallen into misery. Countless demons seize me. Loathsome ones capture me. My soul has been subjected by them. I am torn to pieces and devoured by demons and yakshas and paris and black and hideous and stinking dragons that I can hardly repulse. And I experience much pain and death at their hands. They all roar and attack me. They pursue me and rise up against me. 
All right, so so we must, and of course, obviously, these are the rays of light, but they incorporate reincarnation. So in the hymn exhorting the soul to remembrance, it says as follows. It says, remember the cycle of rebirths and the torture of hell where souls are hurt and oppressed. Maintain the fervor of the soul and the treasure of the word so that you may enter the paradise of light. So yeah, reincarnation. So this, this process may happen over a period of time. Also, the hymn to the soul goes as follows. It says, Come, O souls, to the ship of light, my most beloved soul, who is happy and noble. Where, where have you gone? Return, awake, dear soul, from the sleep of drunkenness into which you have fallen. So uh, we who are not awakened are as if we are drunk, stumbling upon the world. It reminds me of the hymn of, uh, of the soul, the Gospel of Thomas, right? Or I should the Acts of Thomas, excuse me. Yes, the old soul, this memory of the hidden law, which has now forgotten since the day thou didst drink the water of madness. But there is salvation for the soul. And this comes about, of course, uh, and gradually. So, but Jesus, again, uh, he is part of this, this liberation. So you have Jesus, who is the luminous one. You have Jesus, the Messiah. And you have Jesus, the suffering one. Uh, Jesus, the luminous one, uh, his primary role was as the supreme revealer and guide. He is the one who woke Adam up from his slumber and revealed to him the divine origins of his soul, right? But then, of course, the next is Jesus, the, the Messiah. Uh, Jesus, the Messiah, <clears throat> was uh, truly born at baptism, at the baptism of Jesus. Uh, it was on this occasion that the Father openly acknowledged his sonship. The suffering and death and resurrection of this Jesus were in appearance only as they had no salvation idea there. The idea is to represent the idea that we are suffering in this life, but we will have eventual deliverance. And of course, that final aspect is the suffering Jesus uh, in that connection. So, yeah, so we have, of course, uh, lots of hymns dedicated to Jesus, but uh, we want to get uh, to the very ending point. So this is this is Manichaeism. You are learning about Manichaeism directly from, of course, uh, the Manichaeans themselves. And of course, we have the end of the world. They have the same idea. The whole world stands firm for a season since there is a great building being erected outside the world. At the hour when its architect shall complete it, the entire world shall be dissolved. It shall be set a fire, that fire may melt it away. All life, the remnant of light in every place, he shall gather to himself and form it uh, uh, of it of a statue. Even the resolution of death also, the whole of darkness, he shall gather in and make an image of him itself along with the archons, and it goes on and on. Uh, there is this heavenly battle uh, even there, too. So fascinating. Um, um, there's lots of connections, as you can see, with uh, Zoroastrian eschatology, uh, Jewish uh, eschatology as well, apocalyptic literature. And you see the connection uh, also, obviously, with Christian ideas. Okay. Um, now, let's talk a little bit about some rituals. Even a ritual was originally in the Syrian uh, Christian churches. This is a seat placed in the middle of the nave on which the bishop would preside. Uh, the Manichaeans had a uh, throne that had five steps covered with precious cloths, symbolizing the five classes of the hierarchy. The top of the Dima was always empty, as this was the seat of Mani. The Bima celebration was celebrated at the vernal equinox and preceded by various fasts. The five class hierarchies were as follows. First of all, you have the leader, step number one, right? Um, uh, step uh, number two, the 12 apostles. Step number three, the 72 bishops. Step number four, the 360 presbyters. And step number uh, five, the elect. The ultimate goal, again, was the release of all light from matter. 
uh, through the agency of the elect. And, um, you know, the elect did this action uh, through their, uh, through who they are and through the recognition of these ideas. Now, I do have some Manichaean parables, but um, they're, they're pretty hard, obscure uh, to bring up. I guess the one parable I'll just bring up, and I'll just tell you this in plain words, because it's really long, a little short enough. Once upon a time, there's these two snakes. Oh, they like each other. And two snakes uh, all one another, and they created this deep pathway. The first snake created this deep pathway, and the other snake followed it in the deep pathway. Well, this man, represented the evil man, evil one, uh, dug this, this pit, and on this pit, and underneath this pit, he placed a fire because he wants to burn, apparently, the snakes. So the first snake uh, tries to cross, but he's really long. It's a really long snake. He tries to cross, and what happens is that he gets halfway across, and he just doesn't have enough, enough power. He's too heavy to leap all the way across. So this one snake, uh, poor snake, is suspended. His head is on one side, his tail is on the other side, and his belly is in the middle with the fire coming up forth. And what happens then is the snake gets burned, it falls in and dies. Well, the second snake is falling along the same route. It goes, oh no, oh no, I'm not going to be able to cross either. I'm going to get stuck. And so this is the great idea. So the, the snake decides what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn around and burn half of myself in the fire because I don't need to have I don't need to have this part of my body because it weighs too much. Then I can enter into liberation. I can cross the other side. So the snake suffers and feels this pain as part of the snake little body is burning up. I feel bad for the snake. Anyway, so what happens is the snake now is like half of what he was and he's able to leap across the, the chasm. It's so hard. I'll leap across the chasm because he's lighter. And the idea is, well, the concept is, is that the second snake is, is like the elect who has released its material connections, realizes it's going to be in pain, but it will escape the fire and go into salvation. <laughs> so, yeah, I know. Okay. <laughs> this is probably not the kind of parable you want to tell your kids. Although, you know, I mean, it talks about kids. I mean, kids hear lots of weird stories as it is. Um, so there you have it. So where do we go from here? Um, we're going to finish up. I want to bring up something really intriguing, at least from my perspective. What's going to happen uh, is that um, where, what happens to this belief system? Yeah, where does it go? Does it just end in ancient times? Well, of course, what we do know that it, it does blend away with Mahayana Buddhism. There's so many different possibilities there. And um, in fact, Mani's imagery kind of blends with that of, of Buddha. Uh, I see where we're going, right? So, so what happened is, is that, yes, we know from the turf and fragments, where we conclude, we're going to talk about what happened, or astronism. That too, right? A manichaeism. It's a slip, it's a funny slip, because they're both dualistic, Gnostic, case, and Persian. Okay, so manichaeism eventually reached type. Uh, through the Silk Route, uh, through Central Asia. Now, Chinese texts help decipher the history of Manichaeism in China. Uh, there was the, the, the king uh, of the Tang court, uh, Tocastrium, in 719, uh, it mentions the Manichaean uh, who arrives there. Uh, you do have a reference to um, uh, another um, uh, Empress Wu uh, Manichaeans were said to be there. Chinese court was apparently still in the dark as to the nature of Manichaeism, however, until around 731, when they asked the Manichaean priest to compile a summary of his beliefs, which is entitled The Compidian of the Teachings of Mani, the Buddha of Light. The Buddha of Light. So already by this time, Ma Mani is looked at as the Buddha of light. Now, when, when Mayu Khan of the Uyghur Turks, a leader of an incredible fighting force, 
the feet of the weak of Tang, China, uh, from Tibet, converted to Manichaeism in 762. Manichaean temples were permitted in six central locations in China. So now you have setting up already in, this, in, a, in the mid part of the 700s, Manichaean temples. Following the collapse of the Uyghur Empire in 840, not only were the temples closed, but any official, uh, uh, basically, uh, there, there was a persecution that was launched against the Manichaeans in around 843, uh, and many Manichaeans were then executed. Throughout the Chinese sources, the followers of Manny uh, are referred to as vegetarian demon worshippers. <laughs> Doesn't have to me. I am a vegetarian demon worshiper. Well, there it is. That's what they're called. Uh, so not called Manichaeans. They're called vegetarian uh, demon worshippers. This persecution, uh, especially, was was uh, pretty pretty terrible under Wu uh, Tu, who ruled from 840 to 846 who had decided that China needed to be purged from all its foreign influences, also using the seizure of properties and revenues as a means of raising war funds to stop the incursions of the remnants of the Hugon Khanites, as well as to, to quell some rebellions like Lu Xin. Um, uh, Wu Tsum not only persecuted Manichaeans, but he also follow, uh, persecuted Buddhists and Christians and Zoroastrians. Uh, while those who follow Confucianism and Taoism were not included because, well, because those are native Chinese beliefs. So it looks like the Manichaeans disappear. Ah, we thought, right? <laughs> but uh, we realized that Manichaeans successfully uh, somehow survived. And by the 10th century, we know that... Um, that Manny was looked at uh, as known as the uh, an avatar of Lu Tzu. So they're going, hey, you know what? <laughs> um, you know, you're, you're wanting to go for something native. Uh, so what happens is these resourceful Manichaeans are going, well, you know, you don't accept uh, these um, uh, these outside religious influences. So, hey, we'll be connected to Lu Tzu. That's Chinese, you know, that's how they got away with it. Although Buddhism already by this point, long before this point, was already accepted and embraced again. But uh, there you have it. But probably it indicates that there's something there, you know. So with the Mongols' arrival, however, in 1280, uh, uh, provided some relief, uh, what happens is the Manichaeans, they found persecution during the Ming Dynasty uh, in 1388, this seemed to secure their faith. So we're thinking, okay, so 1388, that's the end of the Manichaeans. Shh, don't tell anybody. Okay, secret. Well, what happens now is fascinating. You see, there's, there's something that's going on. There's murmurs, there's rumors, there's innuendos. And something happened during the 1920s, and it started to circulate that some Manichaeans had survived in China during this period of time. And so there was a rumor that told of a single surviving Manichaean temple, a lone sentinel in a remote corner of China, still guarding this once imposing religious heritage. But just as the storm crowd, cloud, cloud, cl clouds uh, started to part, they cruelly closed down again as the war with the Japanese commenced. The Chinese old civil war and culture revolution effectively ended all opportunity. That is until the year 1980, when a single guidebook on the site of Guangzhou was um, was published in Chinese. Fortunately, Sam Lu, I got his book right here, Sam Lu, yeah, professor of ancient history at Macquarie University, was at the right place at the right time, uh, attending Oxford at that time uh, as a junior research fellow, fellow at Wolfson College. Lu had expressed interest in studying Manichaeism. 
catering to his inquisitive spirit, one of his doctrinal supervisors thought uh, he'd be fascinated by a rare copy of a guidebook he found while rummaging around London's Chinatown. Lou was beyond fascinated. He was actually enthralled as after flipping through page after page of this rather flimsy publication, how oh, these are all my words, I published them, he came upon the very Manichaean temple rumored to exist 60 years before, complete with a photo, and a recent photo, no less. Now Lou knew the temple had survived. What? <laughs> so in 1990, uh, after a decade of intense research and careful negotiations, Sam Lou finally stood on the summit of the Habil Hill and the uh, in, in Jaijin, gazing down upon the very Manichaean temple inspiring his studies for so long. But for him, it got even better since this two-story temple, called by locals the Thatched Nunnery, was maintained as a Buddhist shrine and so not permitted to fall into a complete state of decay. When he entered the temple, Lu beheld a 600-year-old statue of Manny himself, known throughout the region as Manny, the Buddha of Light, an image believed by locals to possess very special powers. Uh, he notes, this is a quote from Lu, he notes that the statue of, of, of Manny uh, differs from the ordinary statues of Buddha in several respects. The latter normally depicts Buddha as having downcast eyes, curly hair without a beard. The statue of Buddha in this shrine, despite its Buddhist-like pose and backed by a halo, stares straight at the spectator. He is bearded and does not have curly hair on his head. Of course, a further hint was a 14th century inscription in the courtyard instructing the reader to, quote, uh, to chant as follows, purity, light, great power, wisdom, the highest and sur surpassable truth, Manny, the Buddha of light. Woohoo, Peter, uh, thereby declaring the four attributes of the Manichaean father of greatness right there. But many of the nearby villagers believe the word Manny was related to the word Muni, which is the Chinese word for Buddha. So that was the confusion and able to say. It became very clear how this, this evidence may be reinterpreted, especially by those having very special, special uh, agendas. So in 1991, a year following their successful uh, excursion, UNESCO officially declared the temple a World Heritage Site by the year 2000, Lou managed to create a team of experts on Manichaeism committed to, ex to explore the site and general surrounding area for more clues of this ancient religion, including the village of Punzhou. And so uh, one day in April 2005, as the research team was busy documenting Christian Manichaean tombstones, uh, inscriptions at a museum in Xinjiang, the largest urban center in the area, the local scholars working with them showed them a photo revealing a red-faced Manny statuette, carefully positioned in a place of honor within a local household shrine. Subsequently, the scholars were personally invited to examine the image and make their own evaluations. The husband of the household said the statue was handed down over many generations from his wife's side of the family. But of course, everybody's being very tight in the fact Everybody's been tight-lipped, even in other places where there's possibilities. So what happened? What happened? Okay, well, looking at this, uh, they realized that uh, uh, there are some interviews going around, and uh, uh, they realized that there are other statues of, of, of Manny, the Red Manny, that are in other households. It's not just that one. Um, and so the question is, does it survive or not? <laughs> Is it there or not? Well, there are two emerging theories. This is a great place to, to talk to end. According to Lou and other scholars, the major disruption in traditional beliefs in the area can be pinpointed to the 1920s and 1930s. This is where the rumors were spreading about their survival. 
Uh, there was a zealous Buddhist monk who appeared on the scene during the 20s and 30s, convinced of his right to compel people to believe, even by force if necessary, and fully commit to the reforms of local traditions, cult rituals, and beliefs, and that, of course, is to Buddhism. He seized the Manichaean holy site, declared it a Buddhist temple, and by assuring the villagers that the word Mani and Moody really meant the same thing, he announced that the statue inside the shrine was indeed that of Buddha himself. So, uh, Lou says he was so successful, they totally Buddhized the religion, but perhaps not. Uh, perhaps this Buddhist monk was not successful after all his efforts to wipe his name out of existence because Mani, the Buddha of light, is still known by that name. And it must be affirmed that it is very possible the Manichaeans, even after the 1920s and 1930s, still survive in secret in China because, after all, that's the only way they could survive. Why would they emerge <laughs> now? Because when they realize that history has been against them, because all would happen is that for something to change, and all of a sudden they become a persecuted group once again. So you can decide whether or not, whether it's true or not. Did Manichaeism just survive into the first part of the 20th century, or is it alive and well today? It's up for you to decide. I have a feeling it still survives. Although we do have modern followers who have since uh, come upon it and follow this practice, but I'm talking about from an unbroken lineage from the past, from ancient times. It's a good question. It's a good thought. But I hope that I enlightened you, <laughs> enlightened you uh, about Manichaeism. And I hope you enjoyed this talk. Um, if you have any questions, please ask. And thank you so much for being here. Yay. Yay. There we have it. It's so, not. so a lot of that, those materials, a lot <laughs> of my research was based uh, on materials I studied at Claremont Magic University and through books that I received personally from James Robinson, uh, who was, of course, famous for orchestrating the Nag Hammadi Library. Uh, I have some of the books that he personally had that connected this right here in my own hands. Uh, so it's the real stuff using the primary sources that you heard verbatim. In fact, much of my talk was basically Manichaeans telling you what they believe. So you know it. <laughs>